What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new to my channel, welcome to my channel. My name is Tony Brienne and in today's video we'll be discussing why people are choosing to have kids less. Y'all may be shooketh by the title but yeah I went there because that's what everybody's calling it and I wanted to be bold and exhilarating and exciting especially in a new city and in my new place and in my new setup. So I hope you guys like this setup. For the next few videos it may change depending on if I do or don't like this setup. I hope I like it. Um, as of now like just looking before recording I've liked it um, but but if you guys have been following me for a while, y'all know I've always wanted to have my plaque up in my videos. And there is my baby right up there, along with the beautiful gift my sister made me about three years ago, almost three years, when I hit 10,000 subscribers. So she did a little magazine cover for me. So I really just wanted to show more of my achievements in the background. So I'm hoping you guys are liking this setup. It's pretty similar to the last one, but I think I like it. I think it's more out there. So in today's video, as I just stated, we'll be discussing why people are deciding to have children less. A lot of people are openly saying that they do not want to have children any longer. So I was like, why don't we put a video together explaining why our generation, primarily Gen Z and most of millennials are deciding to wait longer to have kids or just not to have kids at all. So I'm going to stop blabbering my mouth and get into this topic. So without further ado, let's get straight into today's video. Taking you in this moment. Today's quote of the day is I calmly walk away from people in situations that cause anger or disappointment. Today's verse of the day is Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and it reads But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The U.S. birth rate has reportedly dropped significantly in the past 15 years. And as I stated earlier, we are now seeing more mothers and non-mothers advocating for not having children. So we will be discussing the various reasons why birth rates are dropping so drastically and why women aren't exactly excited to become mothers. And the first point we're going to get into is none other than inflation. According to IMF.org, inflation measures how much more expensive a set of goods and services has become over a certain period, typically a year. Inflation has become very drastic in recent years, primarily in 2022 in 2023. And why inflation has become so significant today is due to the imbalance of supply and demand. Basically, we have less things than the request of what people want them at. I will give you guys the perfect example of what I was taught in fourth grade by my teacher when she discussed supply and demand during Black Friday. So say there are 100 TVs and there are 500 people that want those 100 TVs, the price will become inflated because the demand is so strong they know people will buy those televisions anyhow. And that is just a minuscule example of what inflation has become in the United States of America and even globally. For instance, energy prices have spiked significantly in 2022 when Russia decided to invade Ukraine. And of course, during the spike of COVID, when people weren't buying stuff, a lot of businesses lost a lot. So they're now spiking up prices in order to gain profit from the year's loss. So it's just a hot mess out here and it's kind of scary to live, especially during these times. And then imagine adding a kid into the mix of that. So the Wall Street Journal did research in reference to children being born less and less. And they stated that the number of babies born in the United States started plummeting 15 years ago and has not recovered since. Initially, researchers believed that the cause of this drop was because of the 2008 recession, but the birth rates continued to fall even as the economy recovered, though it's now plummeting again. Monthly figures show that there were about 3.66 million babies born in the U.S. last year. That's 2022. A decline of 15% since 2007, even though there are 9% more women in their prime childbearing years. Back in 2018, the New York Times conducted an interview for people aged between 20 to 45, asking them what is stopping them from having the amount of children that they truly want. Of the top 10 most common responses, seven of them all circled around finances. Having children today is seen more of as a financial burden, making them seem less desirable and less exciting to have. I mean, Gen Zers and Millennials have record level student loan debt. Many have graduated during and after the 2008 recession. And now many can't even afford homes due to inflation. We're always told, don't rent, don't rent. Rent is just throwing your money away. But at this point, it seems as if buying a house is throwing your money away as well. As of August of this year, mortgage rates rose to the highest level in 23 
years, with the national average 30-year fixed mortgage rate reaching 7.48%. And if you don't know what that means, whenever you are buying a home, most people purchasing a home are going to need a loan. In most cases, when you're loaning money from a bank or from a private lender, they're going to want to make sure you're going to pay that money back. So they will attach on an interest rate. So an interest rate is set every single time you take longer and longer to send that money over back to them. So when it comes to a home, because homes are so expensive, they're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions. There are programs set in place that allows you to pay with any given time. So there's the 30 year fixed mortgage rate, which is most common. And then there's a 15 year plan. So these plans come with an interest rate and the interest rates today are at 7% or 8%, meaning you will be paying seven or 8% more than what you purchased the home at if you pay it off within that time frame that you signed that agreement to. I really hope I explained that correctly. I think I did. I have not purchased a home yet, but I'm almost certain I explained it right. If I didn't, please correct me in the comments. So say you say, you know, it makes no sense to buy a home at this point in my life. So I'm just going to get an apartment because the interest rates are just way too high. Well, the apartment rent is skyrocketing in itself. According to numerous sources, the average rent for an apartment ranges between $1,702 to $1,850. Now, obviously that varies from state to state, but in the whole of the US, that is the average rent for a one bedroom apartment. Okay, so that's what you got. You either got your house or you got your apartment. It seems as if it's a lose-lose situation. Now let's add on having a child. Giving birth on its own costs over $18,000 in the United States of America. And don't let your child have any complications. Now, obviously, health insurance plays a part. We do have health insurance available. But what if you don't have health insurance? What if you can't afford health insurance? Because that's still something you have to pay for. People are pretty screwed. And even with health insurance included, you're still paying thousands of dollars just to give birth to that said child. So say you have your baby, you paid off how much it costs to give birth to that child. You're like, oh my God, I have this baby. It's great. Wow. Baby girl, now it's time to get back to work. And who is going to watch little Marley? You have no one to watch Marley because everyone is now working until they're over 60 years old because everything is so expensive. So grandma and grandpa can't help. So now you're stuck using the USA childcare system. And the average cost of childcare is $14,760 annually in the United States of America. Yeah, that's a pretty penny. But let's not forget all the other expenses because remember we have health insurance, we have car insurance. Oh wait, we can't even buy cars anymore because cars are so expensive. So don't forget to add in that monthly payment for your car that you just bought for $36,000 that was made in 2008. Okay, so now you have your car note. And then you also have to have car insurance because in order to get a car, you need car insurance. Then you have your health insurance. Then you have groceries, light bill, internet cable, cell phone bill. You like to watch Netflix and Hulu? Oh yeah, you have all those subscriptions too. We have Netflix, Hulu, Paramount, BET Plus, Prime Video. Am I missing any? Oh, Max, Stars, all these other things that we're paying for now as well because everything's a subscription and requires a fee these days. Credit card bills, commuting back and forth to work, gas. Oh, parking because some places you need to park your car and that's also an added expense within your week. And etc. etc. I can go on and on and on. So y'all hear all those monthly expenses? But meanwhile, the average salary in the United States of America is $59,428. And let's not forget, they take taxes out of that. So we're gonna do the paycheck calculator. Okay, I have my phone right here. And we're going to type in my yearly salary. This is the average salary for an American, $59,000. $428. Your estimated semi-monthly take-home pay is $1,809. So your gross paycheck is $2,476 and then they take all that money out. So it's $1,809 and that's due to taxes, pre-tax deductions, FICA and state insurance taxes, and post-tax deduction. Now imagine if you lived in a different state because I know New York's taxes are pretty severe and California are as well. This is just Georgia. So that means the average American is taking home $3,618 a month and half of that is going towards their rent or their mortgage most likely. And the rest is going to all the monthly expenses that I just told you guys about. Do you think childcare can fit in that mix without someone maxing out their credit card. Why the heck would someone want to have a child in today's economy when inflation is so darn terrible? That could have just been the whole video, but trust there is a lot more to discuss. The next point we're going to be discussing is the honesty of the woes of pregnancy and being a parent. Now, before we discuss the woes of pregnancy, y'all may need to get the women in your lives that are carrying children or have carried children a very nice gift. And that goes into the sponsor of today's video. 
I've always severely struggled with finding good quality jewelry that is also beautiful. I've tried all types of different websites, I've tried to shop in store, but it's always a struggle to have jewelry that is pretty but also lasts a while. So when I found out about Hall's Kern, you can imagine how genuinely excited and surprised I was to find jewelry of such high quality. Hall's Kern indeed has stuck to their motto, which is naturally unique, uniquely natural. For instance, the earrings I received from Hall's Kern are very unique unique and pretty and you won't see a lot of people with it. Hallskern has every piece of jewelry you can possibly imagine from earrings to rings to watches and to necklaces and I'm not typically a ring wearer but the rings that I received I completely loved because they're so simple yet unique. What's up guys I'm about to film my brand new video the video you're watching right now and I wanted to put on one of my Hallskern pieces of jewelry and it's this gorgeous necklace with this little cute pearl right in the center that I am absolutely obsessed with. So we're gonna put it on for this video just to add a little pop to my outfit. Take the pain away. Wow, this necklace is absolutely stunning and it blends really well with my OG necklace. I love this a lot and I love that it is a two-part necklace. These styles of necklaces are like one of my favorites. I think it adds a lot of detail. So stunning, so beautiful, and I'm absolutely in love. So if you want to look unique and stunning in Hall's Curtains jewelry, please use my code TONY15 for 15% off your purchase. More details will be linked in the description box. And thank you so much Hall's Curtain for sponsoring this segment of today's video. Women in history have always been taught their sole purpose in this world and in this lifetime is to be a mother and be a wife. We were literally told this for years and back in the 1900s, that's what most women did because they thought that's what they were only valued to be. This made it very common for girls to get married and have children in their late teens and early 20s. Yes, we still do see this today, but it's not as much of the norm as it was back in the day. Now when we see young girls have children, we're like, you're ruining your entire life. <laughs> that's because we now see that there is more to life besides just being a parent. Today, the average age for a woman to become a mother is 30. But why is that? Why has it changed so significantly from what we saw back in history? So as I discussed, women started seeing that there was more to life besides just being a mommy. And that first began with education. Even today, the difference in age when women decide to become parents primarily stems from the educated and non-educated. Women with college degrees have children an average of seven years later than those that don't. And they often use those years in between to finish their education and to build their career and increase their income. Now it's different in all cases so don't even try it. Y'all really be trying it with me sometimes. <laughs> Women were now being taught that they were able to figure out their passions and learn more about themselves before becoming a mandatory aspect of someone else's life. Or should I say someone else or someone else's with being a wife and being a mother. So education really got the ball rolling because it wasn't until the 80s where the male and female ratio in colleges kind of evened out because women were going to school in the 1900s but it took time for it to be an even level playing field and now today even more women go to college than men which is crazy. The next point we're going to talk about is social media and how social media has really shaken the table when it came to motherhood and what motherhood really is like. With the rise of social media in the past decade, more women have felt comfortable expressing their traumas and their experiences being parents. We are always shown the beauty of motherhood, the beauty of being a parent, and it's almost as if it was discouraged to complain about it. Women didn't feel like they had a safe space to talk about the hardships of being a mom. Like think of your favorite movie and think of when women just speak about being a mom and they talk about childbirth and they're like, oh, but it's all worth it because I wouldn't change it for the world or I have all these stretch marks and I wouldn't change it for the world. My body never looked the same. My boobs are saggy but I wouldn't change it for the world. Then you hear people speak about childbirth. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen but then they almost died on the surgery table. Women were always told to embrace the beauty of bringing children into this world even if they didn't see the beauty in it themselves. We never heard the true reality and rawness of pregnancy, childbirth, and motherhood as a whole until women started giving us an unfiltered reality of what it's really like. 
Some things that women would talk about and that I didn't even hear about is things like preeclampsia, hypermesis, gestational diabetes, high blood pressure, potentially becoming blind, becoming paralyzed, losing your teeth, etc., etc. No one mentions these things. And if you guys don't know what hypermesis is, because I did not know until I had two of my followers, well, two people that I follow personally discuss what hypermesis is. And it's you just throwing up your entire pregnancy to the point you lose so much weight and you're so sick because you can't hold anything down. Hyperemesis gravidarum is a fancy way of saying excessive vomiting in pregnancy. But what does that really mean? Because you can throw up a lot and not necessarily have this. We have to have at least three episodes of vomiting per day plus another big bad symptom, one of a few, which include a 5% weight loss, electrolyte imbalance, or something called ketosis, which is what happens when your body runs out of carb sources to run off of. It's used all of its glycogen stores, and it's now breaking down so much fat to run off of that it releases these things called ketones that show up in your urine, and we can test for that. Essentially, you're starving but not just of food, of water too, because a lot of people who have hyperemesis can't drink any water either or keep it down. And typically someone who has issues with hyperemesis will have issues with nausea and vomiting their whole pregnancy. Um, hopefully not that bad all of the time, but if you meet those parameters, your provider should be sending you into the hospital for an inpatient stay, or at least at the very least rehydration. Some risk factors, so things that'll make it more likely for you to have this is if you are a first time mom, if you're 25 years old or younger, um, if you're thinner, so people of size actually that's protective against this if you have a female baby if you have multiple babies in there so twins triplets things like that a history of migraines um, reproductive technology so if you did IVF these things all increase your risk for having hyperemesis many of us have terrible terrible nausea terrible vomiting that lasts like the whole pregnancy but they don't quite meet the parameters for hyperemesis that sounds like torture that's nine months of throwing up every single day I hate throwing up everything makes you feel sick you're super nauseous you're vomiting guys that does not sound enjoyable at all but no one's gonna mention that and then i've heard severe gum bleeding due to being pregnant like there's so much that we hear of from these women being so honest about their experiences things that we don't see in the books that they provide for us about being a mom or being pregnant and they don't even show this in the movies and tv shows and in schools they don't show us any of these things Oh, and then how can I forget about having the baby, right? You think it's all over. Okay, I did nine to 10 months of torture. Oh no, it gets worse even after the baby. Things like postpartum depression, third degree tears while giving birth, and how it hurts so badly to do number two for 10 days to two weeks. What? No one talks about that. How you continuously bleed after giving birth down there, having a C-section and how you can barely walk or move. A woman said that her literal uterus fell out of her after giving birth. It fell into the toilet. And then she just had to push it back in because that was considered normal. <laughs> what? What is that? But what? I don't know, I feel like a weird lump or something in my hoo-ha. A weird lump that's very descriptive. What do you think it is? That's the thing? I don't know what I think it is. It, it just, it feels very weird. It's like a lump. But, I mean, I don't know. Okay, what do you want me to do about that? Um, can you hand me the mirror? The mi- Okay. Thanks. It's my uterus. I'm sorry, you're what? My uterus is on the outside of my body. I'm holding it in my hand. What do we do about that? Please call the midwife. Like right now, please. I don't, I don't like holding my uterus in my hand. Hi, midwife? Yeah. Uh, Kaylee said that she's holding her uterus in her hand, and she wants to know what she's supposed to do about it. Uh, she wants to know if you can push it back in. Push it back in. You... Like, just... Just push, push it back in. That's, that's what she said to do. Just push it back in. Now what? Well, did you push it back in? Yes, I'm still holding the open. No, I don't want it to fall back out. She pushed it back in. 
you said she'll be right over. Okay, so do I just sit here holding my uterus? She wants to know what she's supposed to do while she waits for you. She said to just put some underwear on and then go lay down on the couch. Okay. <laughs> oh wait, there's more. Postpartum depression, sleepless nights, never leaving the house, your body never looking the same. Like even if you snap back and you look good, your body will never look like how it did before you gave birth because everything was moved around. We literally are expected to become parents, but who told us that this child stuff would be so traumatic? No one told us until the mothers told us who it was already too late for. <laughs> So you may see in the comments of these videos that I'm talking about whenever mothers are sharing their experiences of being a mother, whether that was during their pregnancy days, their birthing moment, or after having their baby. And you'll see people commenting whenever it's something really traumatic. Where's the girl with the list? Where's the girl with the list? I'm sure you may already know who the girl with the list is, but if you don't, I'm going to explain what that means if you were to have seen it in the comments or you never heard it, period. So this so-called list first went viral back in February of 2022 when a user decided to make a list from her notes app talking about the pros and cons of becoming a parent. In the first half of 2022, she decided to put together this list and she would like stitch other videos of mothers discussing their postpartum experiences. And she would add on to that list of all the woes of becoming a parent, well, the pros and the cons. And when she published the finalized list, there were only 35 pros and 350 cons of becoming a mother. <laughs> Even though she has not updated her account in over a year, that phrase has become a part of pop culture, I would say. It's now a common phrase. Whenever people say it, we all know what they're talking about. It ties into the woes of becoming a mother. That's why you'll see where's the girl with the list whenever any mom shares her experience becoming a parent or shares her experience with her toddler, her older child, whichever. It's just all about parenthood and why parenthood is not as enticing as we were told it should be. So I had to do my due diligence and share with you guys some of the videos that were added onto the list. So let's take a look at these videos that has scarred a lot of girls from wanting to become a parent and it may now scar you. So maybe I'm doing my job or I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> take a look at these videos. Here's a compilation of messes I never want to have to clean up, ever. Eggs in the bed. I don't think I have to say more on that one. Raw eggs in your bed. <laughs> I've seen kids put a lot of stuff in toilets. They'll just put anything in there. Anything except what's supposed to go in there. But here's something new I've never seen before. What are you doing? Get out! Ew. Moms and expectant moms to be, I'm so sorry that I have to share with you another fact about childbirth that I did not know until it actually happened to me. So you may know that you will have to birth the placenta after you have a baby. So that's like something I did know. What I did not know was that the placenta can get stuck. And in order to get it unstuck, your doctor will stick their whole forearm inside of you. And then they do this really fun thing. I thought I had an electric hand mixer inside of my body. I am not joking. I asked my mom who was at the foot of the bed what was happening to me. And I'm fine now and everything was fine, but it is horrifying. And my husband was terrified and it does not help that he has an aversion to blood. Yeah, y'all are probably shook and like, what the heck did I just watch? That's how I feel every time I watch any of those videos. <laughs> Many TikTok users, and of course they make their rounds onto Twitter and Instagram as well, but a lot of people that have watched those videos has openly stated that they did not know that many of these complications and traumas would be a part of motherhood. They did not know it came with it because it's not openly put out there. It's almost as if they try to trick us into becoming a parent in order to continue populating the world. Because clearly, if we knew what came with motherhood and what could potentially be, a lot less women would be choosing to become parents, which is why you're seeing a lot of young women deciding not to become a mother. Could this also be seen as fear mongering? To a certain extent, I do believe it can be seen as fear mongering because a lot of these cases are like 
one in hundreds of thousands that has happened to some of these women. But I think it still is important to show what could potentially be you because you'll always say it could never be me and then it quickly becomes you. And you can't say that you didn't know that this could be a part of it. I feel like all women should be told what comes with becoming a parent, what comes with pregnancy, what comes with postpartum before making such a life altering decision. So fear mongering, it is just a bit, I would say. But overall, I think it's very crucial for mothers to share their experiences of what it's like to become a parent. So moving right along, let's get into America's lack of support for mothers. So I briefly discussed postpartum when I was discussing some of the points that women made when it came to becoming a parent and just the various complications that comes with postpartum, which is right after you have your baby, that we are not taught and that America's healthcare system does not take as seriously as I think that they should. So as I just stated, the American healthcare system does not support women as much as they should after women go through such a traumatic event in their lives. Giving birth to a child though can be seen as beautiful and it is beautiful. You're bringing a new life into the world and your body did that. It's amazing, I love it. But it is very traumatic and it can be. So many women lose their lives or almost lose their lives while giving birth. Let's just start off with pregnancy. For almost a year, women are growing a whole human inside their body. And it's almost as if that human is like a parasite. Now, I don't wanna call babies a parasite, but if you really think about it, there are a lot of symptoms in pregnancy that kind of gives off parasitic vibes. Babies literally can suck the life out of you while you're pregnant. So yeah, I guess you can call it a parasite. Maybe a beautiful parasite, but Parasite nonetheless. <laughs> Let me not call the baby a parasite before I get the mommies upset. I was once a parasite too and so were you. No. <laughs> but during these 10 months, our organs are literally moved out the way for this little baby to grow into. Our bodies are stretched out and growing so quickly and that's when stretch marks develop because the skin is growing so rapidly. Pregnancy literally alters your brain chemistry and has your hormones raging like nobody's business. And then you give birth to this baby after your body went through all these changes. That's still is quite a shocking effect to your body and your hormones are still in balance because you just were carrying a child and now within seconds you're no longer carrying a child so your body is trying to balance itself out and sometimes with that hormonal imbalance your brain alters and that's when postpartum depression can develop and anything in terms of mental health illness with postpartum develops. Oh let's not even get into postpartum because we still have to deliver that baby right? So you're delivering that child and regardless of how you deliver that child, it's going to be painful. Like nine out of 10 times, you'll be in pain, severe pain at that, like off the charts pain. Whether you're giving birth vaginally, whether it's through a cesarean, you will be in pain. Okay, whether it's during that moment or after, there's gonna be pain and discomfort, that's what comes with it. And that also is very traumatic or could be very traumatic because women literally almost lose their lives while giving birth. There's so much blood gushing out of you. There's just a lot going on down there. Our pain tolerance. Y'all, I can't even, I don't know, cause I'd be ready to tap out during my monthly cycles, but the pain is astronomical. So after we give birth to this baby, we are completely out of our minds because we just pushed for nine hours or we just got our stomach and organs ripped out out, put on the side and now there's a baby in the world. The nurses and doctors shove that baby in your arms and within two to three days you're expected to go home and go take care of that baby for the rest of your life. And some women go into hospitals, birthing centers, whichever, with no support and they're expected just to go through this life altering moment with no help. People say, oh it's your mother instinct, which I'm sure is true to some extent, but it still is very much traumatic. And even for those that do have support, it still could be a very life altering moment in their life. Postpartum depression, known as the baby blues, is a form of depression that happens after a woman gives birth to her child. Some symptoms include insomnia, loss of appetite, intense irritability, and difficulty bonding with that baby. The crazy thing is, postpartum depression happens a lot more than what the media likes to show us. One in 10 women experience postpartum depression within a year of having their child. Untreated, this condition can last for several months to several years. And postpartum depression is considered minuscule compared to what else happens to some women after they give birth to their child. There's something called postpartum psychosis and this happens to one in every 500 women, which is a lot more common than you may think. 
Postpartum psychosis is an overt presentation of bipolar disorder that is timed to coincide with tremendous hormonal shifts after delivery. It leads some women to have harmful thoughts of themselves and their baby or actually going on to act on these said thoughts. And there are a lot of cases of women either taking their lives or their baby's lives due to postpartum psychosis. And there are a few stories out there with women that have postpartum psychosis that it's now being talked about a bit more where they have done some egregious things after having their child and not having as much support as they may have hoped or that they may have needed. With all of these conditions and disorders being so common, you would think that the healthcare system would try to implement more support for mothers. But no, they don't. Something as simple as allowing a mother to sleep, I think it would help a lot. Earlier I told you guys that the average hospital bill is $18,000 plus for childbirth. And what's crazy is that the women are the ones doing really all the work to push that child out. I mean, you look at history, a lot of women gave birth on their own. I don't even know if I want to give birth in a hospital, especially because of costs like this. I might just do a birthing center or something of that sort. I can't see myself giving birth in a hospital because like I just hear such crazy things, but we'll see when that time comes because it ain't happening anytime soon. But with that cost, I definitely believe a night nurse should be included at least for the first month to two months after a woman gives birth to her child. So if you guys don't know what a night nurse is, a night nurse is someone that would spend the night with you, will spend the night with your baby so that you and your partner or you by yourself can get some sleep. We all hear about the sleepless nights that parents deal with after giving birth to a child due to the newborn stage and newborns getting their days and nights mixed up. So a night nurse would come in handy to step in and allow that parent to actually rest, especially when they're dealing with that child all throughout that day. Newborn phase, I always say, I feel like they're not like humans just yet, like they're still supposed to be baking. A lot of women struggle bonding with that child because the baby just cries, sleeps, poops, and eats. You don't really know this kid until like three months in. So I think the first month or two would be helpful because because it'll allow the parent not to look at their child as a burden, but actually learn to develop a relationship with them. Night nurses, I've heard so many women on TikTok, which is why I think TikTok is such a great platform in terms of that, speaking on their experience with having a night nurse and how it has been so helpful for them compared to like maybe their other pregnancies when they did not have a night nurse. So the issue why a lot of women don't have night nurses is because it's not included in that $18,000 bill. It is another out of pocket experience. Loosely, a night nurse can be between between $30 to $60 an hour. So imagine having a night nurse every single night for a week straight. If you're gonna be sleeping for about eight hours, let's say I'm gonna put $50 because that's the middle between 30 and 60, we'll say 50. So say it's $50, well 45 is technically, but we'll put 50. <laughs> so 50 times eight hours, okay, that's 400 a night times five, that's $2,000 on its own for a week. And imagine you had that for two months, that is $16,000, okay? It is definitely a luxury experience, which I don't believe should be a luxury. After women give birth, they should be treated like the princesses that they are because they just did something that only a certain percentage of people can do. Only women can give birth, men can't give birth. So it is a beautiful thing. And I think that we should have that incorporated in the American healthcare system. I think this would cause less women to complain about having children or complain about the newborn phase and actually be able to embrace it. If only they were not delirious and actually got some sleep. But our healthcare system is a joke on its own in a lot of cases. So I'm not surprised that so many women have to sit there and suffer after giving birth. So the best advice we can give is to just make sure you have a support system. But unfortunately, that is not the case for a lot of mothers, which gets into my very next point, single motherhood being on the rise. The United States of America has the highest single parent household rate in the entire world. Nearly 24 million children are growing up in single parent households. And that is about one in every three children in America. That is incredibly common. Of this 24 million, 15.4 million children come from single mother households. So there are a lot of single mothers out there. After everything I just listed earlier, why would a mother choose to have a child on their own? Now, obviously I know in a lot of cases, this is not 
not a choice. But if you guys look at how many single mothers there are and how many single parent households there are, it's a lot more common than you think that women are doing this thing on their own. These women are waking up by themselves with not even just a newborn. Maybe they have two older children that are in the toddler phase, the demon phase, I heard. <laughs> and they're doing it all on their own while still having to work, while still having to deal with finances, while still having to deal with their mental health, while still having to be okay. It's difficult. And a lot of women are just choosing not to even potentially put themselves in that predicament because you can't think, oh my God, I found the one. This is such an amazing guy, husband or not husband. And he ends up being the complete opposite or he struggles with the fact that you changed because you became a mother because you carried that child for nine to 10 months and you went through all that trauma. So you bonded with the child a little bit more than he did. And he don't want to be with you anymore because he's like, you changed. Or he notices how hard it is to raise a child or y'all just grow apart. Maybe you had the baby you're like, hey, I don't really like this guy anymore. So women are just choosing not to put themselves in that predicament or to try to avoid it as best they can by going in and not having children at all. And that goes into my next point, which it kind of circles into single motherhood. And it's the amount of women that are openly stating that they regret having their children, where they'll post on TikTok saying, I love my kids, but I don't like them. And a lot of the women that I see state this are single moms, actually. Not everyone's gonna admit to this, but I hate being a mom sometimes most of the time i want to be selfish i want to put myself first i want to put my mental health first but with a child with special needs it's like where do i have the time where do i have the mental capacity i i'm gonna flat out say it i was not meant to be a mom especially to a child with special needs like no one tells you how patient you need to be I have no patience. My anger issues is like a ticking time bomb. Like it takes me so much to just hold it in until I can't anymore. And this is me when I can't. My son kept me up until 6 a.m. yesterday. I had four hours of sleep, if even that, with a pounding migraine because I haven't seen the dentist in a while and my tooth is just in excruciating pain right now so there's that this morning i'm trying to have a good day you know i always try to be positive but it's so hard i made him waffles something that he likes waffles and syrup didn't want to eat it instead he wanted cheesy bread okay so i heated up the cheesy bread did not want it like, I literally went into the kitchen last night because I was so frustrated and just started banging my head on the cabinet because I just cannot. I really, really do applaud all of the mothers out there, mothers period, and the mothers to children with disabilities, um, mostly because you know what, it's, so hard when the government doesn't give a fuck about autistic kids the funding some people have waited a decade for and these kids need therapies and those therapies aren't cheap so it's like you're playing a waiting game if you can't afford the therapies which are like 150 dollars an hour um yeah like i just i'm just really at my wit like you are a mother i'm a, a whole you mother. can't say that i'm I a can. new mom so i still be like oh tiptoeing mm -mm. i won't say that i dislike motherhood because i'm not true to this i'm new to this what do you mean by that though alicia tell the people i'm not tiptoeing on the marble floors i don't like motherhood what don't you like about it i don't like the pressure i don't like the responsibility i don't like that i am a driver because these tiny humans can't drive so i never wanted to be a mom um because i was like that is too fucking hard i can't do it um and then i incidentally became a mom and i was correct this is too fucking hard <laughs> love my kid I fucking hate being a mom. I fucking hate being a parent. Like, I fucking hate it. And I feel bad for saying that, but, like, I wish I wish someone would have let people with BPD know that, like, we really shouldn't be moms. Like, having a kid is too fucking complicated. I don't want to do it. Like, I don't want to be responsible for this tiny human. I just want to be responsible for myself, and it's too late now. 
I didn't know parenthood was going to be like this. I didn't know I was going to be doing it all by myself with no support system, no family, no anything. I didn't know if I would have known, I would have never done it. I don't care what nobody says. I do not care what nobody says. I don't care what nobody says. Everything, at the end of the day, it always falls on the mother. Everything, at the end of the day, it always falls on the mother. Fathers have the best life, the best luxuries. They don't have the anxieties and the worries of a mother. They don't have all the responsibilities and expectations of a mother. Everything is always the mother's job, the mother's fault. Where's the mom? Why is the mom doing it? Where her kids at? It's always the mom. And being a mom, it is so stressful because you just have to deal with all these anxieties and pressures and expectations while you with a man who does not go through the same things. They just get to live lousy, dozy, flousy, blousy. And no one is pressuring them. They can go out and not have to stress about it. are their kids good or people judging them for living their life. Being a mom is so stressful and so constricting. And I'm really at my breaking point with this stuff because... When is it time for me? I love my kids so much that I can't just be the mom that says, forget about it, let me put myself first. I can't do that. And it's hard, because sometimes I want to, but I know my kids need me. And at the end of the day, before anybody, they're always going to have me and need me. So I have to sacrifice and keep taking care of my kids. I just had to vent about that real quick, because this is so stressful, so stressful for me. It's supposed to be my birthday week. My birthday weekend just passed. I didn't even get to enjoy my birthday weekend because guess what I spent the whole weekend doing? Taking care of my kids. I was stuck with my kids. Yeah, that is the life I have to live as a mom. Just my kids, my kids, my kids. And you know, my kids just started school today. My birthday is Wednesday. So once again, I can't just turn off the mommy mode. I have to be there and take care of my kids, make sure they get to school pick them up from school there is never no time for me never and i fear there never will be until i'm probably about 30 and then i can finally live my life then i can have fun then i can feel like i matter by the time i'm 30. you hear these women sharing their experiences of motherhood and you are getting the raw and the real of all the pain and trauma and mental health issues that can come with being a parent. And you're like, why the heck would I want to do that? Why would I want to end up with the same traumas? Why do I want to end up with that body? I'm not saying mom bods are disgusting. Like, let's keep it real. Mom bods are amazing because y'all did an amazing thing. But some women like their bodies that they had at 20 and they want to maintain that body. They don't want to have a child where it could potentially be quote unquote ruined. So all these things come to play when we talk about why the F Them Kids movement has started. And with the F Them Kids movement, there have been lots of people joking about having an, you know, getting rid of that baby before the baby comes into the world. We see it a lot with young girls as well, like jokingly, like they'll make a TikTok while they're in the room at Planned Parenthood about to get rid of the baby. It's so much more lax. I think that it is kind of making people a little bit less human when it comes to thinking about a child. We don't look at it as a beautiful thing. We now look at it as a burden where we really have to consider is having a child worth it or not. All right, y'all. So that is the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. We have to get the discussion going in the comments. What are your thoughts on why women are choosing to have kids less? Are you one that is trying to have a kid? Do you want kids? I do want to have children. I still do. Don't get me wrong. But one thing for sure that I've learned from seeing other women speak about being a parent is that I don't want to rush it. I by no means want to have kids right now. I remember I used to have like baby fever and be like, oh my God, I want a baby. But then I got a pet and I was like, Burr. This is enough responsibility for right now. And then I also heard a lot of women sharing their experiences on TikTok. And I never want to be regretful of my children. When my children get here, because I still do want kids, I want to feel as if I live my life and I genuinely like them. And all the pros and cons that comes with being a mom is all worth it, which I hope it will be. I don't know until I become a parent because I've heard positive things. I do wish we did see more positive now because especially on social media, we don't really see the positive. Everyone just seems to hate being a parent. Um, so that makes it even more of a reason not to have children anytime soon, but I'm really waiting. And I think it also has to do with FOMO and the fear of missing out. A lot of women are missing out on the experiences. I think ever since COVID happened, a lot more women and a lot more people in general, the young people, we have been talking about traveling more, how traveling has been more important, going out more, trying new things. And having kids hinders you from doing a lot of those things because 
this new little person becomes your main responsibility. And I think that's why a lot of women are also holding off. I know that's why I am. I don't want to ever feel like my kid is a burden. That's what I mean. So like if I want to go on a trip, but oh my God, I can't because I can't find a sitter. Like I don't want to ever be put in that predicament. And I want to be financially responsible, literate, and financially capable to raise that said child. So yeah, that's my thoughts on that. So I wanna know what you guys think in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thank you guys so much for watching. We're on the road to 200,000 subscribers. I literally love and appreciate you all so much. Even with the pros, the cons, the good, the bad, the ugly, I still love y'all. Y'all are here supporting me and I will forever cherish that. And yeah, I'll see y'all in my next video. Love you guys, bye. Mwah. Taking you in this moment Come get close like your own name Read your aura, you want more of all this love You'll be your name Release all of your burdens